It's harvest time in the Northland after an unseasonably warm and very successful garden season. We'll look at all the conditions, good and bad, that impacted gardens this year and answer your lingering yard and garden questions right here on this fall harvest edition of Great Gardening Straight Ahead. We're like producing a serious amount of food. We hope to be able to provide food for the community. I love sharing the garden with others. You can do a lot of fun things with broccoli. All of our students here are involved in gardening. It has a sign on the door that says my happy place and it really is. Hello and welcome back to Great Gardening. I'm Pamela Fish. Well, look at this bounty. We have vegetables, flowers, fruits, courtesy of our uh, garden experts, and they are horticulturist and educator Bob Olin and garden professional Deb Burns Erickson. Nice to see you guys back in the studio, and thank you so much for, for being here and social distancing with me on the garden set. I really do appreciate that. Well, it is our pleasure, and it it's is. a lot of fun to be back here live in yeah. the studio. Right. It's going right. to be a with fun each evening. Other. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, it's been an interesting season. It's been an, an interesting year. And uh, for gardeners, though, this season, there's really been um, a renewal, a renewed interest in gardening, and, and really um, a lot of enthusiasm, much to be thankful for. Yeah, it's been a remarkable season. And we, you know, gardening is the number one hobby, but it, uh, many, many people had never tried it before, got involved this year. So we have a lot of new gardeners and they were just greeted with a wonderful growing year. So we're, mm -hmm. we're very fortunate that way. Everyone's a gardener this year. Everyone's Everyone a gardener. There we go. Yeah, yeah and, and really are. you know, as, as hard as times have been for a lot of people in business and retail, I think you could attest, Deb, that the, the nursery business, the gardening business was good. The best year ever. Across yeah. the board, most Isn't people. Isn't that something? Mm -hmm. yeah, well, that's We're great. very fortunate that's compared great. to a lot. A, a wonderful silver lining. Mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm. As always, we learn things along the way, and uh, we're going to talk about all of that. And we also want to hear from gardeners across the region who have questions and concerns. We have volunteers from the St. Louis County Master Gardener Program who are here to answer the phones when you call. So call locally, 218-788. 2844. You can call toll free 877-307-8762. Deb and Bob are at the ready with solutions to your gardening needs. But first we want to talk about some specific conditions during this growing season in the Northland. And uh, overall, as we said, it was excellent. Overall it was an exceptional year. Um, Warmer than average, and yet not with the extreme heat that you might, <laughs> you might expect. Matter of fact, the hottest day was June 2nd and 3rd, 93 degrees, and that was it. Mm -hmm. uh, we did have, and some people are probably uh, well aware of this, we had a very late frost in many areas. June 12th, you experienced that, mm -hmm. I experienced mm -hmm. that, not along the lake, but uh, that was very, very late frost. And then we had an early frost, other places, uh, was September 9th. Right. So we buttoned it up on both ends, but uh, we had a very dry June, and some people can really attest to that. It was dry in the northern part of St. Louis County, very dry in Ely, very dry down in parts of Carlton County. So June, which is normally our wettest month, mm -hmm. turns out to be our driest. Right. July, which is typically our driest month, turns out to be the wettest. So we were about five inches above normal in the month of, uh, of July. And actually that worked out pretty well because it, it really brought those crops that were germinated, uh, brought them along very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, August again was warmer and a little drier. And here we are in September, which has been a little cooler, but we now have a warm spell coming. So it's probably gonna t be, turn out to be either average or even a little above average. Okay. Sure. Great mm -hmm. growing year. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah. uh, plenty of moisture once we got to July and mm -hmm. uh, very fine sunlight in between. So we had a combination that really allowed us to grow a lot of great crops. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there were some issues though. And a as you said, um, weather impacts fruit set, weather impacts disease and um, insect. Yeah, weather really impacts a lot of things. And that can be, of course, the moisture, which we talked about, relative humidity, uh, amount of cloud cover, all these things impact uh, how plants grow. So certain varieties will perform well in one year and they won't perform very well in the next. 
And that was a little bit of a surprise. Uh, some varieties that have been extremely good for us didn't do that well this year. Others were absolutely spectacular. Uh, we had great fruit set on a lot of the vine crops. Cucumbers were tremendous. Uh, peppers were tremendous. Uh, I, I think eggplant, because we had trouble with fruit set, it was a little too warm when they were setting the flowers. That was a little difficult. Uh, some varieties of tomato were spectacular. Others, which generally performed so well for us, I can use celebrity as an example, didn't do quite as well as some of the other varieties this year. So every year is a little different, and I guess what we learned is plant a diversity of varieties, right. plant a diversity mm -hmm. of crops, watch your schedules a little bit, and even though we're getting warmer, uh, don't be fooled. We can have late frost and we can have early frost right. in the fall. Um, also, some some disease, some issues with that. Uh, powdery mildew was a big one. Um, we're beginning to see some yeah. of the diseases that were characteristic just a little bit farther south. We are seeing them creep north. We're seeing some insects creep north. But powder mildew was very difficult. Maybe we can talk a little bit about that. Let's just mention, though, first that um, we didn't have the kind of tomato blight that people have seen, right? And we uh, didn't have the insect pressure on the cabbage family. Yeah, um, it was remarkable. Uh, the fungi that causes early blight, alternaria, just uh, the conditions weren't right for it. So really, we, we didn't have too much trouble there at all with that particular disease. And uh, again, th there wasn't much pressure from the cabbage looper and the uh, uh, the other uh, cabbage, uh, the imported cabbage worm that causes problems with that family. Good. But we had a lot of problems. Powdery mildew. And here's one picture, and then we got another picture of it, Bob. And uh, yeah, what what was going on with that this year? Well, again, uh, relative humidity. That, that fungi is, just thrives when temperatures are between about 68 and 82, so that very moderate warm. So conditions were perfect with the humidity. Saw a lot of it. Uh, don't be surprised. Uh, Cucumbers, buy a good quality cucumber that's got a good disease package. Stay away from uh, straight eight. I know a lot of you folks love it, but there's no disease resistance there. Uh, buy a little bit better, a little pricier seed, better hybrid, because there's resistance in cukes, there is resistance in melons, uh, but the vi other vine crops, uh, such as our winter squash and our pumpkins, we still are struggling with resistant varieties. There's some fungicides that can be used early, even some rather benign materials like a wettable sulfur. You might want to be ready for that, but when we talk a little bit about garden cleanup, mm -hmm. anything that's diseased, any of your vine crops, that's, gotta that, go. that's got to get off the garden mildew. plot. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, back to the good news. It was a great year for peppers, wasn't it? It was spectacular, and I'm not exactly sure why. We, yeah. we had the temperatures, we got the fruit set early so that we could take peppers and ripen them. Mm -hmm. Green peppers ultimately should be red peppers. <laughs> the <laughs> yeah, July moisture, orange. I think, really yeah. helped because they need a lot of moisture, and people aren't always aware of that, but sure. that July moisture that really July helped. That July moisture helped I the think peppers. So. Okay. And the warmth in June, I think, helped us set fruit mm -hmm. early so mm -hmm. we were able to ripen a lot of them. And then we want to mention the color, because the color was beautiful in all of the flowers and, you know, the fruits and vegetables. There's some examples right there. Just spectacular, and Deb can certainly address mm -hmm. this, the color that we saw in, in so many of the floriculture sure. crops. And the breeding tremendous. that they're doing, just because color sells. Mm -hmm. And it really did sell this year. Color mm -hmm. sells, and we're seeing that in the vegetable world, too, across everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're seeing, uh, you know, purple kohlrabi and purple lots of red cabbage, and we're seeing purple potatoes, and there's color everywhere. Mm -hmm. And that's good and in, the, in the edibles. Mm -hmm. Not only is it novel. Good and good for you, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, Absolutely. these colors are all the antioxidants, mm -hmm. so, uh, and they're actually some of the old heirlooms. Oh. So we're going back to some of the older materials, and uh, this is all good. And well, fun. that's a, a wonderful recap. Thank you so much. And, um, you know, thank you, Mother Nature. Or <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe we'll Whoever. get two in a row like this yeah. next yeah, year. Nice. <laughs> right. Okay, well, Northland gardeners can be pretty creative. And earlier this summer, we met a Duluth couple whose sustainable gardening practices took them up on the roof. Here's a look. When we were thinking about building a new garage, we decided that we wanted to make it do various different things for us. So we decided to put a rooftop garden up there, and we also enlarged the roof so that on this side we have a compost system, and on the other side we store our firewood. I just built beds around the perimeter and then a big bed in the middle. And usually I grow a lot of carrots up there. It's a good place for root crops because Root crops you plant, 
in the beginning of the season and you harvest all at one time for the most part. Toward the end of the season, it's easier just to plant things and then harvest, you know, all at once. I have a few green beans here in the corner, sunflowers that I've planted all around. The main crop up here though is onions. We are self-sufficient in onions. Last year I, I grew enough that carried us through to about the end of March and then we started using some early spring onions that grow up there. Well I think that was the idea is to, um, to try and be as self-sufficient uh, or nearly self-sufficient and sustainable as possible and things. So like Mary said, onions, honey from the bees, and what else? Eggs. Uh, eggs uh, we don't buy any from the grocery store. We grow a lot of our own food, potatoes quite a bit, but I'd say we get a, at least half of our potatoes we use. I always let dill seed in, so we have a lot of dill, and I, I take a lot of it out, but it's pretty and we use it, so I let it grow. I put in some collards. It's a good place up here for collards. Um, not many critters get up here to eat it, and it likes hot. It's windier, it's hotter, it's drier. You know, learning what different things grow and, and work well and what don't. The roof is slanted such that it drains into the 300 gallon rain barrel, and so it give, you know, we, we get to reuse that water. And so that's, that was a huge part of it, is um, in terms of being sustainable. The chickens make the compost, the compost makes the soil, the soil makes the plants, and the plants produce food for us and nectar and pollen for the bees. And we get the honey from the bees. So this really had to be an engineered garage in, in a lot of ways. Parking the car underneath here is the least of it, actually. It's of what this building does. It was fun to see that rooftop garden and uh, just hear about all the things that they're doing that uh, really are sustainable practices and a uh, popular way to do things now. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. in, in town with the limited space and they're doing a great job with sure. a real integrated uh, production system there. Yeah, it's exciting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, let's get to some questions, you guys. Um, Richard wants to know, is BT detrimental to bees and does it have a shelf life? Ooh, two good questions. Yeah. <laughs> That's our <laughs> reaction. Like, yeah. Well, BT okay. is the spore of a bacteria, Bacillus thuringiensis, and there are a number of varieties. Many, many varieties. Several of them. And mm -hmm. uh, the most common is, is one of the name brands is Dipel that we use on the cabbage family to control the imported cabbage worm and the cabbage looper. So it's very specific for Lepidoptera, and bees are not Lepidoptera. So if you're using Dipel or using the variety for control of anything in the cabbage family, I wouldn't be concerned about any damage to the bees. Other varieties though, you want to read the label, you do. and that should be very specific for you. Yes. Okay. Um, Deb Stan wants to know if we need to water more when we're doing container gardening. Absolutely, right, yeah. and you do. And it's a good practice to water in the morning, water heavy. Um, sometimes not in the evening, unless it's been a really hot day, then you might want to hit it in the evening. You just do wor worry about a little bit more disease pressure if you water too late. But, and you need more fertility in those containers because you're going to wash it out. Mm -hmm. um, you can top dress with a compost and let that wash through. You could use, there's been some um, people have using alfalfa as a nitrogen source nitrogen. and just dressing for vegetables if you're doing container vegetables okay. and then um, some time release f um, for just ornamentals. And, and sometimes people put things in the bottom of their pots too like I've heard of like disposable diapers that oh. hold water. Yes, mm -hmm. yes yeah. and diapers are good for that. They do, <laughs> mm -hmm. they hold it and then they just completely disappear. It's a great use for mm -hmm. diapers. It mm -hmm. is. It, it does a great job. I don't uh, subscribe to people adding like space Things that take up space, pop mm -hmm. cans, soda cans, oh, things. You okay. need the soil. When soil you're in a container, you need real soil and good soil. Good soil. Well, that's right, good to right know. Right now, people will be tempted to reuse those same soils, but you really mm -hmm. should take them out of the containers. I'm guilty. Renovate them, <laughs> add some more additional <laughs> compost, 
Add mm. perhaps a, a good organic fertilizer. Your plants will do a lot better, right? Right. And oh, they should do a lot a better. So oh, you've okay. you got to recharge that, that soil. Sandy from Hibbing wants to know, should asparagus be moved in the spring or the fall? Uh, very, very early in the spring. Okay. Yeah. So that's one of the first things we want to do. Yeah, before we'll, it sprouts. We'll be and looking uh, forward to. <laughs> absolutely. Okay. Uh, Mary from Holyoke asks, are gardeners seeing more cutworms than usual? Ooh, that's another good hmm. question. I, uh, I didn't see it this year nope. personally, but nope. there are about 20 different varieties <laughs> of cutworms. <laughs> uh, the big one that, that gets our tomatoes is what they call the dingy cutworm. And it can surprise you because it's the larval form of a moth and they can fly everywhere. So you say, I never had a problem with cutworm. I think you should always protect sensitive plants like tomatoes with a wrap around that collar, mm -hmm. around the main stem with paper or tin foil or something, something. like that. Mm -hmm. Because you never know in any given year, you may not have had the problem, but you can have it this year because mm -hmm. they fly from location mm -hmm. to location, mm -hmm. the okay. adults. Oh, they fly? Yeah. The, ad the, the adults, adults do. The moth. Yeah, the moth mm -hmm. itself. Okay. The adults yeah. do. All right. <laughs> Irma from Duluth wants to know how to replant a peony and how deep should we go with that, Deb? Ooh, not too deep on the crown. I mean, because a lot of times people, their peonies won't bloom because they did put them in too deep. But bring the, uh, make sure the crown is up and is at, at least at, at soil level, if not a little bit above. Mm -hmm. But now is a great time okay. to put in peonies or to move peonies because they really do bulk up in the fall substantially. Much it's, better now. Oh, yes. much better. This is the time to do it. Great. I use mm -hmm. a three finger rule. Mm. That, that crown, that bud should not be more than three fingers deep below the mm -hmm. soil mm -hmm. surface. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Well, we'll have more questions coming up. Um, but right now, there's no one kind of garden or gardener in the Northland. Every garden that we have had the pleasure to tour is unique. We take you to a garden now in Brit, where a couple's amazing gardens are rooted in family, faith, and fun. We're Dave and Jesse Shunk. Um, we live up in Britt, Minnesota, a little bit north of Virginia, and these are our gardens. And we do this together. Dave does the vegetable gardening, and he does all the heavy lifting for me, and I do the creative part of it. This is probably my newest bed. About five years ago, we added this to just kind of complete the circle around the river rock. I bought this selection of cone flowers and the tall cone flowers came back pink. It's a castor bean plant and my friend Mary love cast, loves castor bean plants. So when I saw those, I bought them just about and planted them in May. They were maybe about four inches tall. And you know, they're just so decorative. Very poisonous though. <laughs> so you need to be careful if you have animals that eat plants around. This is called Love is a Mist, and it's really a sweet little flower that I got from my friend Linda, and it seeds itself everywhere. I have a lot of plants that will seed. I have a hosta bed over here, and then a woodland garden behind, and that area of the house was grass, you know, when we moved here. We really have developed this, this property over the 25 years we've lived here. Dave has really done a lot of the metal work for me and found a lot of the pieces. He's built the arbors with the, the metal on them. Really like the varieties of ferns. And then I really look for things that are a little bit different like this, fern, this tall fern here. It has the red stem on it that makes it stand out from other things. I think that you, you will notice that I've incorporated all of this birch into here, into the woodland garden. So what we have done is we put a metal um, rod down, put the birch tubes over the metal rods, and then filled it with soil and planted into them. They actually, you know, are pretty hardy, <laughs> pretty um, sturdy. It's fungus growing on here. But look at how cool they are, and look at the flowers in there. <laughs> That's the kind of stuff that to me is just so super fun, that, you know, this is what it's about. It's not, it's not for me about bragging about my gardens, but it really is just the joy of creation. This is a reblooming clematis that I got last year, 
And the first sets of flowers come really full like this. They have the doubles. And then as it reblooms through the summer, it will come back with just a double petal. I have a wisteria vine growing up the house. It's bloomed earlier this year already. Yes, and you can see the seed pods up there. Evidently, you have to keep it clipped back because it blooms best when it's cut back. Well, a lot of people ask me what, what gardens of Petra, and I decided to name my gardens that because that's the philosophy of our life, that God is our rock. And all of my beds are built out of rock, so it just seems so fitting. The meaning of Petra is God is our rock. And this summer, I've worked on a lot of the other chairs that you see in my beds and uh, just fun little um, craft projects to do. Last summer, I was just kind of getting used to retirement. And this summer, I fully embraced it and am really, really enjoying being out in the yard. A lot to see there, and we'll take you back to Jesse and Dave's garden a little bit later on. But um, right now, Deb's going to show us how you can refresh some of those pots. It's not over yet, guys, because we can still have nice pots we into can. the fall. We can. So this, we had 26 degrees this morning. Mm. We've had repeated Ooh. frost since... Um, the ninth, Since right? The ninth of yeah, September, and right. so then this one. So this is a canna, and then there's um, uh, sweet potato vine and some other things in it. So the canna, it will store more energy in its root as it sits longer. Mm -hmm. So you could pull this out, and um, but we like to pull them out later in October. We just don't want the entire soil ball to freeze because sure. that's what's going to. Um, destroy the bulb. It'll mm -hmm. turn just to mush. But you could store it in the pot and you could put it in a cool location or you could pull it out and you could repot it. Mm -hmm. um, so we have pulled out one of these that was in this pot and all we did was put in a uh, flowering kale and ornamental uh, or not ornamental, but Swiss chard, sure. and like the, and these are just still in their containers, and they so you, can stay like that, in and their they can stay like that in the container, just nice. like that, and this will stay nice until November. Um, most of it, like Bob was saying earlier, that um, the Swiss chard probably won't take the frost as easily mm -hmm. as, but the other two will fill in nicely, and it can go into November, into um, deer hunting season. And, and are those ornamental kales edible? Oh. I love the ornamental kale. I think the ornamental kale is better than the regular kale. I think everyone should try it. And really? It just has a, a softer so flavor. I wondered about that, if you can eat, eat ornamental kale. You can and kale. you should. No it's, problem. It's, yeah, should, it's, huh? it's really good. I don't care if right. I really sell good any of them because I'll eat them all. Thanks a lot, Deb. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, questions now still coming in, lots of them. Carolyn from Grand Marais wonders if you should fertilize in the fall or spring. And are worm castings good for fertilizing? Wow. Well, you know, it depends on the plant. Uh, anything that's actively growing now, I think of the lawns in particular, number one time to fertilize is right now because they're green and they're actively growing. Uh, most other materials that are shutting down are not green and active. You don't want to fertilize now because you don't want to encourage active new green growth. That'll be fertility in the spring. So everything from your blueberries to um, so many trees and shrubs, really, we want that fertility in the spring. We do not want it right now. But the lawn is the one big exception. Get that mm -hmm. fertility out there now. Especially if we're going to have a warm week and people fertilize their ornamentals right. and, we'll and, their, and their perennials. Absolutely. That's a big issue because they'll start to burn up all their oh, stored sure. energy. Mm -hmm. So you really want to be cautious if we're going into a warm. That's right. Mm -hmm. And the other, the other thing that we do want to remind people, if you're fertilizing in the lawn right before rain or irrigate, because so many of our nitrogen sources, all urea that denitrifies goes back to the air unless you get it watered in. So watch the weather patterns. Don't put it now if we're going to have 10 days of dry weather. Put it on right before the rain when the plants are dry or sprinkle or irrigate it in. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Nancy wants to know if you can dig up lupins from the wild. Have you done that, Deb? Uh, no, because <laughs> transplant, and, uh, and I'll even say for us wintering over, because we bulk a lot, mm -hmm. lupins don't do well for us. That tap root, right. very difficult to transplant or to move. I would gather seed. I would wait for the seed to dry and gather seed and direct seed that oh, and do okay. it sooner than later just because you're going to want fertilization on the lupins. Sure. 
And uh, we should be aware that they're almost becoming invasive, so be a little careful mm. how you distribute all so of that pretty. seed. I know they <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, Rick says my northern pin oak tree um, died about a third of the top of it died. It was six years old. Any idea what might have happened there? Well, again, oaks, we're outside of the, uh, the, the major range, so depending on the site, you need a real good site for them to, to do well. Northern Pin will do fine on a good site. Mm -hmm. But I would rather suspect it's just uh, maybe winter injury or the site wasn't proper and it's just died back. It's not uncommon. Okay. Mm -hmm. Terry wants to know about a uh, crabapple tree that was damaged, and can he or she use a sprout from the damaged tree to start a new one? Well, it depends on where the where the damage, damage was. was. Oh, yeah, okay. mm -hmm. if it's a Where's sprout it from the from? base, um, most of these newer varieties are going to be uh, grafted onto a real hardy rootstock, so you're not going to get the quality fruit. But if it's a sprout farther up from the what we call the cyan or the upper stock of the tree, mm -hmm. uh, then he certainly could. But it's going to be a little tricky to get that uh, that to root for him. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Dorothy has PG hydrangea tree that died. What's a good replacement for that? I would wonder why she's why did it die and mm -hmm. what it, what does she want to replace it? They're really hardy. They're aren't they? really hardy, so that I would be mm -hmm. suspect of the site yes. and putting ah. anything else in that site. Ah. I want. I would like to know you know how old it is mm -hmm. and really what what left led to it dying before I would want to replace it. It's a good response. I'd say replace it with another PG hydrangea. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. But, yeah. but look at the site and all the things yeah. you yeah. talked about. Mm -hmm. yeah. They're magnificent right now. Yeah. The colors oh, are spectacular. Mm -hmm. They're mm -hmm. really hardy. Uh, yeah. But you do have to have full sun and, and good drainage. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. may be the issue. Okay. Fran from Silver Bay, uh, when's a good time to aerate my lawn? And also Fran says, my peppers are rebutting. Um, should I try and do something with those? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Aerating the lawn right now. You go. You know, okay. ideal mm -hmm. time and plug aerate. You don't want mm -hmm. anything that compresses it. So actually, if you, you you can rent these plug aerators, it pulls a plug of soil out, break the plugs down, and you can actually rake in some compost. So you get that down there. That is the ideal time mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to do okay. that right now. But the peppers. Pepper. Okay, so the pepper is truly a perennial anyway, and you could bring it in and you could winter it, but sure. it's going to bring pests in with it. It's uh, going to bring, you know, mm -hmm. a problem with it. It would get woody inside. I mean, I wouldn't do it, but <laughs> you could attempt it sure, and try to fun. keep the temp up and, you know, keep the right moisture level and not have a lot of bugs coming in with it. Yeah. And if we really have a warm fall, maybe. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> it's no. Too, too late. Maybe. I'm going to disagree with that one. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe some teeny ones coming? <laughs> okay, Linda from Duluth wants to know, do I need to put straw or covering on a hardy hibiscus? You know, go ahead. Okay, well, I've only seen zone four, and where was she at? Uh, Duluth. Okay, um, and you should, okay, the one thing with hibiscus, it has to, ha when it comes back in the spring, it has to have 70 degree soil temp. Wow. People will get, like, they're going to be sure it's dead, it's never coming back, mm -hmm. but you have to give a lot of time to those Luna hibiscus and really good water because they love water. I mean, you could mulch it. Um, and that would be fine because it's just going to, mm -hmm. it, it's not going to just come back from the terminal. It comes from all over. Um, I would, I, I mean, you can, there's no problem yeah. with that, but don't we, give up on it in the spring. We Asia. were at a garden mm -hmm. in uh, the South Shore, um, I think near Washburn, and they had gorgeous hibiscus that, but it was very late in August before mm -hmm. oh, they yeah, came yeah, back for them, but they, mm -hmm. they wintered over there. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. They're always, late. Mm -hmm. I always love this advice, and we see it in, in some of the new super sweet corns. Don't plant until soil temperatures are 68 degrees. Well, if you pull soil <laughs> temperatures, that's the third week in July. July. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so we do have to go a little earlier, but yep. you're right, it will take a long Can't time do to that get here. warm temperatures. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, uh, again, as we mentioned, the harvest has been great. Well, what to do with it all? Uh, at a small family business in Cornucopia that we visited last year, they've perfected ways to preserve some of the best crops to grow in the north. People have been fermenting vegetables for at least 3,000 years. But now, these days, we're kind of getting back into fermentation because of the benefits that it provides us, mainly being probiotic foods. We started Spirit Creek Farm in 2007 we make our kimchi with head cabbage. 
We make all of our krauts with head cabbage, mainly because of the ability to access it from local organic growers. And um, it grows really well here. Everything we buy comes from Wisconsin and Minnesota. Wow, we can take vegetables that are grown here and make them accessible for people to eat all year round. There's no canning, there's no pasteurization, anything. So that's why the probiotics stay intact in it. For what we do, salt is basically the catalyst for making the fermentation successful. We're making curtido. And um, curtido is a Salvadoran recipe. I think it's just so approachable um, flavor-wise. The predominant spices is our oregano and onions. But when we mix it, we take it and shred it. We're gonna make a three pound batch, which is what you could do in your home setup. So basically, you don't wanna go low on your salt. That's actually one thing you should be, that's really important, is do not use iodized salt when you're fermenting. Use sea salt or resalt. Real salt is another brand that kosher salt's really good. Even though we've shredded it, we're breaking up the fibers of the vegetables so that the salt penetrates them. You can use this, which is the really, it's helpful instead of your hands. And this is our big one that we use when we're, we're pounding it into barrels. Because you really want to get the, the um, liquid to come out. This whole process happens in the absence of air. And you liquid. want to pound it in there and get the liquid kind of above the vegetables. Temperature, you generally want room temperature, 68 to 72 degrees. And this is a pretty easy home method. So we could pretty much just put a loose fitting jar lid on top here. Like you just put it on, you don't want it tight because it starts to produce gases, CO2, and it needs to bubble. And so what you wanna do is you wanna set this on a plate in your kitchen or in a bowl because it will bubble over and that is a good thing. Seven to 10 days, maybe more. You wanna taste it, you wanna make sure it's souring like that flavor that when you taste a lemon. I loved that the texture was crunchy. This is curtido in a large barrel. We have a top bag which has water in it, you can see. Um, and then we have a liner bag that is making contact with the vegetables. What this water bag does is it creates a weight. It's keeping the oxygen from having any contact with the vegetables. This is how we do it on big scale. We start our processing in October and we're making stuff through March, April. When it's become sour, you can put it in the refrigerator. Time generally makes things better. The flavor profiles will change up into 90 days. When we started, we started with green kraut, purple kraut, kimchi. We make a fermented beet and beets keep wonderfully. We make um, ginger carrot. Certain vegetables ferment better than others. So fermentation, it's, uh, you know, it's something that a lot of people are getting really interested in now. Of course, we know that uh, canning has been the way to go for years and years. In fact, um, I think we all talked about how they, people were looking for jars and lids because so much canning was going on this season. I saw a roadside sign. Someone said, we have canning lids, and it was oh, a homeowner. Right. <laughs> you know? oh, wow. so, but nice, nice. maybe you want to talk, in this case, uh, fermentation and a lot of salt. So there's your protection there. Mm -hmm. The new canners out there should be aware that anytime you're canning, uh, particularly a low acid food like your, your green beans, uh, you have to have a pressure canner so you can get uh, real warm temperatures. We do mm -hmm. get worried about uh, botulism and that can occur if you under process, under cook or hot water can. Anytime you pull a vacuum, hot water can a low acid food. So when you're pickling, you've got high acid that gives you the protection, fermentation, the salt gives you the protection. It's those green beans and maybe the peppers without any type of uh, yep. vinegar in mm -hmm, there mm -hmm. where we can get into trouble. If you have any doubt, you can freeze or you have another option. Right. 
And well, I'm going to I'm going to talk first about because we mentioned that that it was a great season for peppers. Okay. So uh, let's take a look at uh, one of our own WDSC engineer Patty Alberg grew a bumper crop of peppers. So I'm just going to name name some of them: jalapeno, hot banana, mariachi, hot Portugal, hot banana, green chili, serrano, Anaheim. Anyway, she put together a mix of them to can, and it's a hot pickled pepper mix and. Uh, Looks like she's gonna, she's gonna have peppers all winter long. They look wonderful. But again, they're pickled. Meaning vinegar, mm -hmm. meaning you've got yep. acidity there and that's what provides the protection from botulism. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But another, another way that Deb really likes to preserve her vegetables is through hydration. Or dehydration, right. Because we, uh, we grow a lot and we've canned a lot and it is harder to find jars and lids this year. So we dehydrate, like this is carrots, this is um, uh, tomatoes and these are peppers. So yes. our peppers, and we probably have about the same amount of peppers sure. as she had in those jars in this amount. This, the carrots, this is at least 10 to 15 pounds of carrots wow. once they're dehydrated. And the same with these, this is probably closer to eight to 10 on the peppers. And you just slice them. And the great thing about it is you slice them, you dehydrate them, you check them, make sure that they're crisp and that they snap and they're dry. You have um, like a dehydrator? Yep, yeah, a dehydrator okay. machine, mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. And you slice them all and you lay them out. You have to blanch the carrots first, mm -hmm. which sounds like a pain. But the great thing about these when they're done, they're already prepped for whatever you need them for. They're chopped, throw they're them diced, in soup, you throw, throw them in, in whatever, it. anything you want. I mean, we've even put the peppers and tomatoes in meatballs and really? you just rehydrate them. We do a little olive oil or a soup stock or whatever to rehydrate them. They go into soups, they go into pastas, they go into everything and it's done. Great. And they don't take up any room compared to canning. We've sure, done a lot of canning, sure. but this is so I tend to easier. freeze mine and um, I, I had pretty good a crop of tomatoes and so I chopped them, roasted them with garlic and olive oil and nice. then you know cook them for 20-30 minutes and then put them in a container and put them in the freezer. So mm -hmm. yeah, people that's an have, easy way to do it too. Mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm. If people have any concerns about the possibility of food poisoning then just freeze or dry mm -hmm. because uh, this organism only develops under a vacuum or an anaerobic condition. Mm -hmm. So, And then just learn a little bit about proper safety times and temperatures because mm -hmm. people are canning, which is wonderful. Great year. Uh, yes. People Good. are cooking, they're canning, mm -hmm. we're getting back to the old ways, and I think the population is getting healthier in the process. Oh, for sure. Let's and I hope. would say if the seals broke, they'll just throw the whole thing away. Don't right. think, the seals oh, broke. I should smell sure. it, I should, nope. Chuck yeah. it, because if there's <laughs> botulism right. in there, you don't want it anyway. Right. Uh, let's get back to some questions. Um, here's one about tomatoes. Jean from West Duluth planted Big Mama tomatoes. She grew them from seed, and they got what she thinks is black tip rot. Um, her other tomatoes were fine. What is it? Um, How could she have fixed it, prevented it? It's probably blossom end rot. Blossom end rot. Okay. Blossom end rot, which mm -hmm. is a calcium deficiency. And uh, did she tell us, was that in the garden or was that in containers? She didn't say, she just said she grew them from seed. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, every variety has uh, a propensity or tendency toward blossom end rot if there's a calcium deficiency. That particular variety might be very sensitive. Mm -hmm. And the answer is uh, there are some supplements that you can use, very uniform watering is important and you can actually mix a little bit of lime. That you don't want to overdo that, but mix a little lime that's a calcium carbonate component of lime that will help alleviate that problem. Soluble Even the eggshells too though, right? I mean, you can or? You can, except it's very slow to break mm -hmm, down mm -hmm. some of that calcium. And then the water, so water, water, water. For this season, we want a real soluble form of calcium so it gets to the plant, gets mm -hmm, out to the mm -hmm. blossom end of the fruit. All right, May from Friedenberg has a red pine that's 30 years old, and this week it lost two-thirds of its needles. Is that an issue? Any idea what happened? Well, this week I, I've noticed uh, that we're getting the natural needle drop, so it depends on where they're dropping from because they shed their needles just like uh. a deciduous tree sh sheds its leaves. So there's a lot of natural needle drop that's occurring, particularly if it's farther toward the, the main stem or trunk of the tree. Mm -hmm. So we need a little bit more information on that. It may okay. be just natural. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, our first Grow and Show for uh, Fall Harvest includes a season-long look at a pretty impressive growing operation in Wright, Minnesota. Frank Domengi of Cloquet declares it an excellent summer for gardening, with a little water needed. And his harvest is evidence of that. A good yield of carrots 
and onions hanging to dry. Frank used a string method for tying up tomato plants for the first time this year with great success. One plant yielded some 50 tomatoes. There's a nice sized pile of cucumbers and pumpkins with great fall color stand at the ready beneath the crop of sweet corn. Garden season started early for Charles and Irene Carlson who begin all their plants from seed for this massive vegetable plot at their home in Wright, Minnesota. Throughout the season, Charles shared updates with still pictures and videos providing a look at the progress. Here are the gardens the first week of June. In late June, the first drone shots with the promise of the abundance to come. And more video with a long view of flourishing crops. Mid-July, an overhead shot of the pea picking process. And late July, an update from Charles on, quote, all the good stuff. Carrots, peas, beans, cucumbers, zucchini and peppers, celery, tomatoes and cabbage. The later harvest at the end of August is testament that there's more than enough for the couple. It's just Charles and Irene who grow it all, so there's plenty to share with friends. If you have pictures of the plenty that you grow, send them to Great Gardening at WDSE.org. Okay, back to some questions now. Uh, Cindy from Lake Vermilion has a very overgrown raspberry patch. Should it be cut back? What's the best way to refresh it? Yeah, she probably wants to uh, renovate the whole thing if she can, and that means cutting new rows depending on how she's assembling them, but I think uh, that could certainly be done right now. Uh, she wants to take out all the spent all the spent canes and all the very narrow diameter canes and then probably just take a tiller and open up the rows and then get some kind of a staking system. They really need sunlight to penetrate. So you really want those rows in place. You really want some kind of a trellis system. And even though you're taking out plants, that will really enhance the yield because there'll be more sunlight available. Plants will, will be healthier. Okay. Uh, Chris from Lakeside bought a rose bush, bush from Burns Greenhouse. Mm -hmm. Um, it got huge, and she's wondering how to get it ready for winter. Well, if it's a um, hardy one, then she doesn't need to do a whole lot. Mm -hmm. I, I don't like to clean up a lot. I like that canes to hold snow if it is a, a hardy one. I mean, you could mulch it a bit, but you really don't need to on those um, really hard Morden varieties, um, Therese Bounet, Marie Bounet, um, uh, Will, uh, William Baffin, yeah. really hardy stocks, not, not, not much to do. She could, you know, trim it back a bit, but I really, I mean, shape it. She can do that if it's really big. But if it's not hardy and a, you know, tr a tea rose or a grandiflora, mm -hmm. a floribunda, then she's going to need to do the Minnesota tip, okay. dig it up. You know, lay it, down lay it down and bury, make it, sure. you know, nice little grave for it. Mm -hmm. and <laughs> then put extra um, leaf and mulch on top. I put mine in a rose grave last year, and it Did worked you? really well. Excellent. And I've tried it, but I learned put a string on those canes so you know oh. exactly where they are and where That's you pull them That's such a good idea. I didn't do that. But the yeah. good thing is if you have that tree rose like you had, yeah. and it's in its pot, if you bury that pot, uh -huh. pot down in as deep, the frost will heave up the pot. and It'll just pop up, and you'll see it in the spring. Uh -huh. So if it's Another a nice, good-sized pot. Okay. Just don't pop it too early. Right. Well, <laughs> right now we want to go back to that garden in Brit where uh, Jesse and Dave both grow vegetables, but they grow them in different ways. My garden house was an old log barn. It's a tamarack barn that was built early in this century. <laughs> My husband and boys um, went up and took it down, and the next year he and the boys pieced it back together. And it's the old peg construction of a tamarack barn, and so it will last forever. And I have a lot of fun in here, so oftentimes, you know, we'll just sit out here and have coffee or tea with a friend. And I also use it as my garden workspace. And I knew I wanted gardens around my garden shed. And so the very first year, we just tilled up this whole area and 
I had read all about potager gardens, which is a European type of garden. It's decorative by what you plant in it. It is supposed to be all edible, so it's all vegetables, fruits, herbs, that sort of thing. That's the idea of the potager garden is that, you know, you underplant things, you plant things together you normally wouldn't, and it is the part of this that I really enjoy. But it's really just fun to have the variety of vegetables started early, so I plant in here early May. Um, you know, I've had peas for quite a while. So I have Swiss chard in here, I have rainbow carrots in here. I do mostly the little cherry tomatoes in here versus or specialty heirloom tomatoes. These are white cucumbers. I got just one plant. Look at how they're producing over there. They are the best. Vegetable gardens over here and uh, it's the same place it's been for uh, 20 years. But yeah, I do rotate the plants in different areas every year. So it never looks the same. This year is awesome. Uh, I put some uh, manure from the neighbor over on the garden two years ago and it's really producing now so and it's been an excellent year so. We've never had squash this big. The combination of the heat and the water is amazing to, for what it did. Our potatoes were blooming on the 4th of July which is an unusual thing for us and the broccoli. I have had at least 10 heads of broccoli already. Do you um, live off your vegetables for a long time or? As long as we can. <laughs> we have, still have beans left from last year in the freezer and they're good. So yeah, it's nice. And then we got lots of grandkids that, uh, and we give away a lot of vegetables to the family members. So it's good. It's a fun thing to do. Okay, I just want to mention, um, let's see, while well, Jessie originally had put mulch between the beds of the potager garden, you may have noticed that she uh, replaced it with rolled roofing, which worked really well. Nice, good. One more example of the harvest and reward for hard work that uh, came out of the gardens of Ken Greshwack of Duluth. And a uh, great cabbage crop, and uh, Ken also had um, just a harvest of all kinds of beautiful Summer vegetables fruits. and then all kinds of berries too that, uh, what are we seeing, thimbleberry, raspberry, gooseberry. Blueberry. And blueberry. And blueberry, mm -hmm. yeah. Did wonderfully. There we go. Mm -hmm. All right. Good year. Thanks, Ken, for sending those in. Yes, it was a good year for so many gardeners mm -hmm. in the Northland. Let's get some more questions in before we run out of time. Richard from Duluth says, what are some of the better types of tomatoes for our zone? <laughs> oh, are there about, are there dozens of them? <laughs> well, when I looked at that question answer, I could access 1,500 varieties. <gasps> so there are even more mm -hmm. than that, but mm -hmm. we do trial a lot of them and everybody has their favorites. We, we, we can start with slicers. We oh, go, okay. back, go back to uh, Celebrity and uh, Better Boy, not mm -hmm. Big Boy, mm -hmm. but Better Boy is mm -hmm. going to be a better tomato. Some people like Early Girl. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are a lot of good slicers available. Mm -hmm. Cherries, talk about 4th of July if you like. Yeah, 4th of July, fresh salsa. I, I do like smaller tomatoes because mm -hmm. you're going to get tomatoes. And mm -hmm. I think people need to, when they're planning, they need to plan some small, medium, and large. Because the large, you're not going to get as many. But you're okay. going to get a whole lot more in the cherries and and the grapes right. and the salad size. Um, real quickly, can I overwinter a hibiscus, or not a hibiscus, I'm sorry, that was the fuchsia yeah. hanging basket. That's from Zach in Duluth? Yes, you can. Um, you can let it, it, it can take uh, a lot cooler temperatures, leave it outside, let it start to go dormant. Um, you can bring it in. It still wants to be dormant though for a good three, four months at least. And, and Serena from Little Moray has Black walnut trees that are dying. What's going on there? She's from Little Murray. <laughs> <laughs> trying to grow black walnut. Okay. At one time, uh, the die. DNR wouldn't release black walnut from their nurseries north of Hinkley. So it's, it is really uh, temperature sensitive and cold weather sensitive. All right. Another Grow and Show segment for you now. This one is all flowers. So much springtime abundance in the gardens of Beth Olson of South Range, Wisconsin. Beginning with the apple trees in full blossom. Beth enjoyed fragrant lily of the valley, white trillium bursting out among the periwinkle. She also had a volunteer jack in the pulpit 
making its first appearance. Of the white bleeding heart, a friend said it looked like the wings of an angel. Judy Lundquist's early season wonder is this blue iris made even more special because it was shared by a friend. This splendid pink peony comes from roots divided and shared by five generations of the Myers family. Roberta delights in welcoming it each summer and hopes to see it enjoyed by generations to come. Peggy Gassler of Hermantown shares a vibrant lily called Morning Splendor. And from Terry Norton, this artful selection of summer blooms captured on camera just after a gentle rain. If you have pictures of the plenty that you grow, send them to greatgardening at wdsc.org. All right, thanks everyone for sending in pictures. There's a lot more that are coming in and we love to see them and put them on our Instagram. We'll talk about that. Uh, Deb, mm -hmm. you are gonna show us that you can um, take Save. How, to, how to take the seeds from the cone flowers. Mm -hmm. Everybody loves right. cone flowers, one of our most popular flowers mm -hmm. among Northland gardeners. What do you do? Right, and these are Echinacea Cheyenne Spear, which is a seed variety, so they'll come true to their seed. So um, the great thing about um, these guys are deer resistant and pollinator friendly. Mm -hmm. So uh, great things up here. So all you have to do is find a blossom, like this one is completely black, and you can see that there's no green in it. If you look in inside of these, there's green, it's a green stem. If you're picking, you want to pick this one and cut it back. And if you want to take the rest of those, you can take the rest of those and then hang them upside down in a bag and put a little uh, write on it that it's Echinacea Cheyenne Spirit and put a little rubber band around it so they dry hanging in the bag and the bag catches all the seed. They don't need fertilization so you can start seeding them in the spring. We do some in February and then see how they germinate then maybe more in February and March. Great. Great. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thanks, Deb. Um, and there are other chores to do in the fall that aren't as fun, but let's take a look <laughs> at what they are and talk about them a little bit uh, because we do need to divide um, our overgrown perennials. We can do that now, correct? We certainly can. And mm -hmm. of course, uh, iris and peonies, which we've mentioned, are really the best Great. in the fall, the two Great. that really stand out. And uh, we want to uh, clean out, especially anything with insect damage or disease, right? Yeah, you really want to clean up a lot of that material in the garden. You want to learn how to compost properly, get a good hot compost pile, be a little careful how you manage that, but you definitely want to get all that cleaned out, anything that is insect damaged or, or diseased. Should be and cleaned people love to leave the healthy stuff, though, for... Uh, you know, for, for birds and winter interest. Winter, winter interest, mm -hmm. okay. And mm -hmm. for holding snow, which is yep. our best mulch. Yes. When yes. do we plant our spring bulbs? A little early. I think we'd get into October. We don't want them to jump too early, particularly if we've got a, a real warm fall mm -hmm. coming. But uh, I'd wait a little bit on that for the uh, daffodils and the tulips and so forth. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, plant and transplant trees and shrubs, but we really need to water them and protect them and... Yeah, a lot yeah. of water. I real quickly protect you see you hit it right in the head there lots of water right now uh, support the trees with some some kind of a system there and then uh, uh, certainly we want to protect from deer damage a good fence mm -hmm. voles were so bad right. last wrap year them. so we got to have a wrap or we got to have a column around mm -hmm. them so there's a few things you want to do yeah. but now is really a it's pretty a good great time, to time. Play. great mm -hmm. time and uh enrich the soil. You can pull some of that compost on the soil now. Mm -hmm. We don't want to mm -hmm. do a lot of, if you're going to till in the spring, don't till in the fall. Let's not over till. Mm -hmm. And you want to compost your leaves instead of just raking them in and putting them on the garden. Small amount doesn't matter, but you can have some problems there if you uh, just uh, put it on the garden. Let's compost first. But the lawns right now, we talked about plug airification. Mm -hmm. We had that question, mm -hmm. fertility, mm -hmm. seeding, seeding, weed control, all needs to be done right, right now. now. Okay. Uh, we have time for what? Just a video question, AJ? Yeah. Okay, let's take a look. Hello, and thanks for tuning in to Great Gardening. I'm Pamela Fish. Deb, you um, brought some examples of mm -hmm. some things that can 
put great texture in your yeah. garden. But now back to our topic for this week's program, it's miniatures, and we have some really unique ones and fine examples to share here. A friend brought those in to show us and remind people that they're poisonous. Right. Don't yeah. eat them, they look like blueberries. And I do want to point out that this one here, I don't know if you can see the one on this side, was formerly my endless bummer, but now <laughs> nice. I'm calling it endless summer again because it bloomed for me nice. after about three years. From all of us here, thanks for watching and enjoy the garden. Okay, well that wasn't a video question, that was um, an answer. <laughs> Is Pam gonna be here next season? No, she's not. Mm -hmm. But um, I did, just do want to say, uh, first of all, send you, keep sending your pictures in. You know, we have an Instagram, we have a website. We want to take care of, of all of that and have our pictures sent in for that. But um, I want people to know that um, I'm going to be leaving, and um, uh, it's been a really, a really inspirational and educational ten years. But this is going to be my last show, and. Deb and Bob, I am going to miss you so much. Going to miss all of um, our gardening community, but I'm going to I'm going to try and, uh, and and stay active in the gardening community. And I know that you two will be back to great gardening next spring. So <laughs> it'll still be fun. Call in your questions and uh, and talk to Bob and Deb. We've <laughs> we have certainly enjoyed this, and I know so Deb and I. I want to give you one of my favorite <laughs> funky oh, pumpkins. What a great parting gift. I love this. No, I tell them <laughs> when I cut them in the field, I tell them, I don't tell them where they're going. I just tell them they're going to a good home. Oh, so great. thank you. <laughs> this is such a cool pumpkin. Thank for, you. For all of the great times we've had Thanks together. for all your hard work, you guys. And uh, thank you to the, to the crew and to, and to everybody. It's been really a great experience. And from all of us here at Great Gardening, thanks for watching and enjoy the garden.